Michael, um, you just said, you know, the book is also, it's, it's about, it's not about doctrine. It's, um, although it's an intellectual history of the Western way of, of the Western thinking, I would say, but it's not about doctrine, it's about people. Um, and then it's interesting, it's 17 es essays. Um, um, most of them are about, are about books or words. Um, one of them is about a painting, and one of them is about the invention of the hospice. But it's all about language. It's all about talking. Mm -hmm. um, uh, maybe that's your uh, your choice, or maybe, or maybe it says something about, you know, we need language to, to console other people. Yeah, and I'd... <coughs> That I'm so glad we we have music this afternoon. Um, one of the essays in the book is about the mysterious ways in which mu music can console, and my specific example is uh, Gustav Mahler. Mahler uh, came from a small town in Moravia. Um, his father was an innkeeper. Um, and the family lost several children. Um, Mahler's lost several of his brothers very early in life. And um, in the late 1890s, he wrote a series of songs called the Kinder Toten Lieder, Songs on the Death of Children, and uh, based on poems written by a man who had lost his children. Um, and he wrote these surpassingly beautiful orchestral songs, which some of you will know. I see some heads nodding. It's just extraordinary music. Um, but the point here is he then had a daughter and lost his daughter to scarlet fever and said sadly to one of his closest friends, that he could write the songs before he lost his daughter, but he couldn't write the songs after he lost his daughter. And so the book is always playing with that moment um, where you seek to use art and language and the language of music to convey uh, your understanding of the suffering of others and to console and provide solace to those people. And then something happens to you, and you just, your own musical gifts, your own capacity for inspiration fails you. You can't. You're rendered speechless. So I'm very interested throughout the book in that. There's another example of a different kind. Um, Cicero. You may not know about Cicero, and I didn't know a whole bunch about Cicero, but Cicero, you may know, was the most famous orator of the Roman Republic. Uh, famously facile, famously never at a loss for words. Um, and then in 45, his beloved daughter died. And suddenly, a man who was famous for his articulateness was rendered speechless by grief. So speechless that he had a kind of breakdown. And the interesting aspect of this is it brings home the gendered character of some of this, the differences between male and female on this. All his friends, Cicero's male friends said, Cicero, the world is beginning to notice that you're heartbroken, you're inarticulate, you can't, you're, you've stopped being Cicero. Come on, you've got to get back to being Cicero. Stop crying. The people are starting to, to whisper. They're starting to murmur. You're going to lose your authority as a public man if you can't pull yourself together. And Cicero, it's all in his letters, so it's very dramatic, says, come on, leave me alone. I'm, I'm struggling the best I can with grief. And, you know, I, you know, let me cry. Let me weep. And they say to him, but this is womanish. This is female. This, this isn't what you're supposed to be doing, Cicero. You're the epitome of masculine, stoic, republican virtue. Shape up. <laughs> you know? And so, so Cicero does shape up. 
and concludes. He resumes being Cicero with a toga and the mighty words. And I, he finds words again by returning to his old role of being the masculine, competent, articulate man. But there's some pathos in this. It seems to me it exposed his deep vulnerability. And it raised for me, I think, a, an issue that uh, goes into the present. Uh, we think Cicero's a long way away, but, you know, a thousand years of men were raised to believe that it was unmanly to cry, you know. And some of that's down to Cicero. Some of that's down to this ancient tradition that just associates um, self-control with manly virtue. And there's a hell of a lot to be said for self-control, but I've never seen any real difference between male and female self-control. Both genders seem fully capable of that kind of very dignified composure that we so admire in people who have suffered grief. But it brought home to me, these are two examples. In the Mahler case, it's a man who finds unbelievably powerful musical language for grief and then when it happens to himself, finds himself unable to be consoled by his own music, and Cicero the same, providing languages of consolation for men like him, and then being struck down by his own daughter's death and finding him un unable to speak. So it's not a, that's one reason why it's not a book about doctrine. It's not a recipe book for how you get over loss. It's in fact saying something very different Nothing is any good when it's really tough, actually. Nothing. Um, and sometimes it's only time that heals and only time that repairs. And sometimes it's years later that we hear a piece of music and it triggers emotions that we've held up for, held inside ourselves, and suddenly it's released by, by hearing wonderful musicians. So the whole book is an exploration of the mystery of this process. I mean, I do believe we can be healed. Uh, I do believe we can overcome these feelings. But it takes time. Words sometimes fail us. Um, part of the purpose of the book is to show you just how many um, examples of people struggling with grief there are and loss and how they tried to face that reality. Now that you mentioned Cicero and the way he deals with grief, the, the, the death of his daughter. Um, the first three chapters, actually, you uh, describe, you first explore the book of Job and, uh, and the Psalms, uh, sort of the Jewish way of looking at, at, cons at consolation and grief. Then uh, Paul, the, the, um, Saulus, Paulus, who uh, goes to Damascus and, be and becomes uh, the founder of the church. And then um, uh, Cicero. And uh, what struck me was that... Um, uh, you are the first. The first two chapters, you 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 really engage in them, and you you allow them to. <laughs> you you go a long way with them, although they're religious, of course. But you, and the, but the Stoics, um, you're very critical, yes. uh, more critical at least. So has that to do with sort of the gender role you just you just touched upon? On uh, because you said it, it might have actually been doing harm the way they look at you know mm. how you how you. Uh, lead your life and how you oh. yeah I'm I'm I think the in the book I'm extremely interested in re recurrently interested um, in when the discourse breaks down when the language doesn't work when people really get into a, a spot where they feel such existential anguish that all of their learning begins to break down I devote a chapter to Marcus Aurelius. Marcus Aurelius's meditations are among the most enduring languages of solace and consolation in the Western tradition. But people forget that he wrote the meditations somewhere between Vienna, Budapest, and Belgrade. We don't quite know where. In the Roman camps, that he used to crush the barbarians. So this is an aging emperor, often sick, engaged in what we would call a brutal counterinsurgency war for which he's entirely unfit. 
Marcus Aurelius is the most literate and educated Roman emperor of them all, and he should be sitting having interesting discussions precisely with Stoic philosophers. In fact, he's fighting a bloody counterinsurgency war. And the note, the meditations are notes to himself written late at night um, by a man who can't confess to anybody because he's the emperor, right? Who are you supposed to talk to if you're the emperor, right? So he can only talk to himself. He can only console himself and hold himself together under the pressure of these, this uh, inhuman job. Um, so yes, I think it's true, Yuri, that I give the Stoics a harder time. I give, I, I look at Cicero where Stoicism falls apart. I look at Marcus Aurelius where he's kind of under, under pressure. Because as I say, I'm not so interested in the doctrine because the doctrine breaks down when you're in a jam. That's the thing I recurrently say. Um, and the same is true with um, Montaigne. I have an essay about Montaigne. Well, Montaigne is the great master of the Stoics. His, he lives in this tower in, outside of Bordeaux and ranged against the wall in a semicircle are, is the entire inheritance of the Roman and Greek learning that he knows in the 1580s. He's the most learned man of his time. But the Montaigne that interests me is the Montaigne who says, these bloody books are no good to me. I'm 58 years old. I'm in poor health. My wife doesn't love me anymore. I'm in the middle of a civil war. The peasants are so accustomed to dying around me, he says, that they dig their own graves and lie in them. That's where we are. The plague is sweeping through the France of the 1580s, and there's a civil war on top of it. My books are no longer of any consolation for me. I have to figure out how to live here. And in fact, he takes inspiration from the, from the peasants. He says Seneca is wrong to think that you can master death. This is, again, a point with the Stoics. He's wrong to think you can master the death or overcome your fear of death. I look at the peasants. They die properly. They just lie down and say, that's it. Right? He takes more instruction from these people than he does from the books on his shelves. And that's exceedingly interesting to me. I love books. I've written, I've written a number of them. But that's part of the drama I'm trying to convey. When, what, what do you do when the books fail you? Right? And Montaigne is an example of that. 